Good morning. How's everybody doing? How's everybody doing out there today? Uh, we are glad you are here this morning. If you're tuning in online like Brody Paul is this morning, we hope that you uh, have a great worship experience with us. Um, we don't always say hello to kids from the stage on a Sunday morning, but when we do, it's today. Um, welcome to Village. We are so glad you're here as school is getting started back up for uh, our, our Georgia kids. I think North Carolina, supposedly there's a rumor that they start school here soon. I don't believe it, but we'll see if that happens. A um, few things to run through real quick as we get started. Um, on the fourth Saturday of each month, we go and help out uh, with Matt's ministry here in town. They do an incredible job uh, with, a, with a service industry there, with, with feeding folks, uh, providing food. Um, so if you would be interested in helping out in that, like maybe you, you haven't been able to respond to an, to an email or, or such, uh, we would love to plug you in. Go check out the information desk after church, um, and they can, they can take your name down, let you know what's going on. But that will be next Saturday from like 9 to 12. Uh, and those, are, like I said, it's the fourth Saturday of each month. Um, Village Kids volunteers, those of you who are on our Village Kids team, uh, appreciation stuff is for you. If you haven't picked up your bag, your bag of appreciation, uh, it is out by the Village Kids uh, check-in station, so that is there for you. Um, if you've been hanging out a little bit here at Village and you're like, you know, I'd really like to, to meet some folks or, or, or get plugged in, and one of the great ways to do that is by serving on a team. Um, and if you're, if you're interested in jumping on a team, uh, there's sign-up sheets the information desk for that. Uh, with our guest services, with our parking team. Yeah, Dimple, champion that Dimple. Uh, guest services, parking team, audiovisual, village kids, anything you can think of, uh, we would love to plug you in to jump on a team together because our teams are where it's at. Um, next week, having family baptism celebration for our village kids that have made professions of faith, so we're excited about that. That'll be next Sunday afternoon. Um, and then today, oh, the baptistry is still up. We're just going to, you know, just, you know, it's a hot tub party after church today. We rented it out. No, but we are excited. It has been a great month uh, with, with baptism here at Village, so uh, we, it has been one that we will look back on and be like, wow, that was incredible. So I got to tell you, a first happened last Sunday afternoon as I'm driving home. I got reprimanded for missing the national calendar day. Yeah, you did. I got reprimanded yeah, you did. because apparently last Sunday was National Left-Handers Day. And some freak emailed me, texted me. Just kidding, just kidding. They're not a freak. They're just left-handed. Hey, uh, what? left-handers have rights, too. Ah, I see what you did there. You yeah. see what you did there. Yeah. You're welcome. How long have you been waiting to use that? All year. All year. Well, and so you missed <laughs> left-hander day, too. Left-handed day, too. So last week was National Left-Handed Day, and, and we, we went in another direction. So to all you lefties, we apologize. But we're going to throw you in for today, okay? So are you ready for, for today? So today is actually World Mosquito Day. <laughs> Everybody loves mosquitoes, right? So here's what we want to know as you stand up and say hello to the people around you. When you kill a mosquito with a fly swatter, do you do it with your left hand or your right hand? Yeah, 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 yeah. What hand do you use? Would you think it would be another question? I mean, come on, man. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Stand up. Say hello to the folks around you. Tell them which hand you're using with the fly swatter, and we'll come back singing here in just a minute. Man, good morning. Welcome to Village. We're so glad you're hanging out with us. We're going to sing some songs together. Yeah. That's the first question um, I'm going to ask God um, when I get to heaven is, how'd those mosquitoes get on that boat, man? What in the world? Man, Noah, you would have thought he could have handled that for us. But anyway, man, we're glad you're here. Thanks for being with us. We're going to sing some songs about a God who loves us, who's made a way for us. We're going to celebrate some baptism in a few minutes with our friend Mark, and uh, it's just going to be an incredible morning together. So we're glad that you're here. If you don't know the words, we're going to put them up, and we're just going to, we're just going to sing together. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They 
They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came, and he died, and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Hey. Remember those giants we called death and grave? They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came, and he died, and he rose. Here it is. Those giants are dead. Yeah. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. Before the cross. Remember that fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness Never won did he fail? And he never will. Oh, this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. For the cross, be the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God. Nobody but Jesus Who pulled me out of that pit He did, He did Who paid for all of our sins Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh Who gets the glory and praise Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets glory and praise. Nobody but Him. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. For the cross, be the praise. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God. King Jesus. Man, there's some hope in that right there. A God who loves us, a God who takes on our, our walls and our giants in front of us, turns them into rubble and just gets them, puts them in their place because of who he is and what he's done. And a lot of times it takes sometimes a wall or a giant to remind us, and it shouldn't, but every once in a while we have to get to that place and realize that he is our hope, he's our salvation, he's our restoration, He's a God who rescues. And we started singing this song a while ago, just called Firm Foundation. And I love what this song declares, that Christ is our firm foundation. He's the rock on which we stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. And that's the truth, isn't it? When it gets a little bit crazy, that's the times when I'm just reminded, man, I'm so grateful for the hope and the salvation that I had. But man, there's a there's a part in this song that it talks about when the rain comes and the wind blows. And that's when we really have hope.
because we're built on, we stand on the person of Christ. And we can stand because of who he is. And man, um, I just encourage you, when we get to that part, if that's your story, let's just go for that together. Or if that's your struggle right now, that you would just let us just sing over and around you the truth of what God's up to and what he's trying to do. We're going to sing this. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, well, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. our story and when those storms come we have a hope in the person of Jesus sing this
we're just going to keep singing. I've got a friend. He's closer than a brother. There is no judgment. Oh, how he loves me. I've got a friend. He is my strength. He is my portion. With me in the valley, with me in the fire, with me in the storm. Let all my life testify.
is the truth. For so many of us, God, it, it took a minute to realize or maybe understand that. But God, this morning, we're so grateful for that reminder. That you really, really love us. You proved that through your son, Jesus. Because of him, we gather today. Because of him, we have hope and life. So God, we're just so grateful for the reminder. And God, as we celebrate baptism in just a minute with Mark, God, that's the story. Baptism is just our way to say, man, I'm so grateful for a Savior who died to take my sin on and make a way for me. So God, thank you for loving us like that. Now teach us and remind us and draw us close to that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Grab a seat. Hey, right now in just a second, we're going to celebrate baptism with um, our friend Mark Wright. And uh, such an exciting time. And uh, I got to hang out with Mark some this past week and just hear his story. And it's just incredible. And um, uh, I'm actually going to let him tell you his story just in a minute. But so cool to watch people on their journey of faith. And, and Mark uh, came to Christ a few years ago, but uh, realized there was just another step. And he just wanted, after we've been talking about this and doing this, he said, man, I want to I want to make that public through baptism, and uh, I just want to be part of that. So we are super excited to celebrate with him today. And Village, you know this. We don't have to tell you, but, man, we are going to celebrate. So after you hear his story and, and Mark's baptized, let's just celebrate with him uh, what God is has been doing and continues to do in his life. Check out his story right here. I'm Mark Wright. I live in Young Harris, Georgia, and this is my story. I grew up Catholic in California, Southern California, and got yelled at a lot for sleeping in church. Really never really learned a lot. Just said he died on the cross. They never explained that it was to, you know, for our sins. Kind of got the kindergarten version of David and Goliath and stuff. Thought I knew something until I met my own Goliath. And then it was like, this is bigger than me. I can't do this on my own. Well, you know, I thought I was my own ruler for a long time. And then I realized that that doesn't work. I just started reading the Bible and opened my eyes. It just changed me. I just, I just changed who I am. And I don't want to be who I used to be anymore because I like the guy I am now a lot better. And that's what's amazing about it. You know, I've had people say, oh, it's a book of old. No, it's a book of today. It's a book of right now. And you're in it. You know, I, I don't read. I'm a terrible reader. But if I can do it, anybody can. You gotta come to God on his terms. And once you do that, he'll shine his light on you. And then boom, you have joy, you have peace. And you know, I think the hardest part was having to forgive everybody. And I asked him to help me and he did. And that's for real. Now I got lots of hills to climb. <laughs> Trust me, there's more hills. But us try. As long as I got him backing me up, I can be mountains. It's okay, and it's all good. And I know he's there. I know he's watching. I know he's got my back. And I just want to, you know, further my faith. I want to jump in with both feet. He is watching me, and that really shook me up because I don't know, it shocked me at first. But then after I thought about it, I was like, he really sees me. That's huge. It's just like your father. He is our father. And it's just like a father loves his kids. It's the same thing. It's the same way. And if you try to run and hide, your dad knows you did it. So how would your father feel about that? That's the same father. Yeah, that's how he kind of feels towards us. Be honest with him. Tell him the truth. Tell him you're sorry. Move on. And it'll just be better for you. Uh, my wife and my family have been very encouraging. They uh, teach me, answer my questions, because they know more than me. About scripture and that helps and my daughter uh, introduced me to this church which is good I love this church so that's good and without my family works family is everything I want I feel like baptizing is washing away the old and starting new I'm getting baptized today to let everybody know that Jesus is my Savior that's good isn't it man I'm, yeah, that's right <laughs> I'm a little hot Dave you can down Man, I love that, Mark, I love that you shared your story with us this morning, man. Your family is huge for you. You talked about that, and uh, it's just such a privilege to get to baptize you and uh, to see how your faith is growing and 
and you're just privileged to get to be a part of your story. Amen. Um, so, Mark, because of your profession and faith in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Village, thank you for being a, a people that celebrate stuff that matters, and uh, that's what we want to be about this morning. You guys check out this video, and uh, we'll be right back. Well, that was pretty stinking awesome, wasn't it? Man. So, fun fact, this is the, uh, I believe it's the first month in our existence that we have baptized somebody every Sunday of the month. How about that? It's pretty stinking cool. Now, uh, we don't, you know, we don't, uh, that's not our call when people are making decisions, but it has been fantastic. And next week, we're baptizing a number of our village kids who have made uh, professions of faith. So, Big month for us as a church, uh, and we're glad you're here this morning. Um, so if you've lived any time at all, you're familiar with how advertising works, right? Advertising that would say, hey, you want to live longer? You want to be happier? Do you want to grow as a person? Do you want to make the world a better place? Well, for just four easy payments of $19.95, $9.95, whatever it might be, for a couple of Botox shots for a new life, just call 8675309. Anybody out there? There's a magic bullet out there. There's something out there to make you feel better, be better, do better, whatever. Right? We we know this. We've seen we advertisers, we, we know your game, right? We know your game. We know what you're up to, and we know the game and how it's played. And it tells us a little bit about ourselves. I'm always interested. <laughs> If you tell me about some new product that can, that can do better for my life, I'm interested. Tell me. Tell me about that. I, we're always exploring these new ideas, something that can make us better, something that can help us be more efficient, something that can uh, make life a little easier. And advertisers get this, don't they? Get it. They get it. By the way, advertisers are great at their jobs, aren't they? They're great. You know, we joke about meteorologists from time to time. We're like, man, I wish I had that job. I could be wrong 95% of the time. Everybody still love me, right? Well, that'd be a great job to have. Advertisers, they always seem to get it, don't they? Because they're always advertising these products that make us want to buy them. And when I was growing up in school, when I was growing up in school, you know, we would study explorers. We'd study explorers. And of all the explorers that we studied in school, the one that I completely, totally, 100% got was Ponce de Leon. Ponce de Leon, right? That's the guy right there. And by the way, what a cool first name, right? Ponce. I should have I should have named Jonas Ponce. That'd been a good name for him. Maybe maybe I'll name my next dog Ponce. Uh, our current dog's still very much alive, but um, I probably shouldn't be plotting the name of his replacement, but. You know, um, that's assuming we even get a replacement. I, I'm kind of on the fence about even having a dog. Just being completely honest with you today, uh, we didn't have one for a long time, and then we got one about eight years ago, but I digress. It, while I'm digressing, some of you, I got to tell you, some of you are dog owners, and I hear your stories from time to time about the messes your dogs are making and the, the havoc they're wreaking on your life. You're not doing a good job of advertising dog owning for, for a guy like me, a guy who's on the fence a little bit. Uh, but I digress on my digression. Old Ponce, all right? Old Ponce. The story goes, went out in search of the fountain of youth. You remember this story? In search of the fountain of youth. And that sounds great. Except that's not exactly what happened with Ponce. A guy named Michael Francis, a history professor at the University of Florida, he said this. What Ponce is really looking for was he's looking for islands that will become part of hopes uh, that will be a profitable new governorship. So he's hoping 
to, to get rich. He's hoping uh, to, to get some power, right? New governorship and discovering this land. I mean, that, that, that hurts a little bit. Like I had this image of him, fountain of youth, all this stuff. That's not, that's not what I was hoping. That's it, Ponce. I'm not naming my imaginary dog after you. Thanks for nothing. But uh, another, another pr- professor says, for everything I can gather, he was not at all interested or believed that he would find some kind of miraculous spring or lake or body of water. At least one historian suggests that perhaps Ferdinand, King Ferdinand, who had recently married a woman 35 years his junior, told Ponce de Leon to keep his eye out for it. But others, expect, others experts, they dispute this. I mean, you could see King Ferdinand, he's like 55 and his, his lady friend's 20, and he's like, hey, you know, if you can help a brother out, that'd be great, you know, find this fountain of youth. But it's disputed. It's disputed that, that he found, he was looking for the fountain of youth. In fact, when he finds Florida, when he washed up in Florida in 1513, he names it La Florida, La Florida, which uh, in part was named because it was the Easter season, and Pascua Florida in Spanish means flowery Easter. So there you go, a little, little history there for you. So Florida, flowery. Um, so Ponce discovers some of Florida, uh, does some, comes up back through the Gulf Stream, which provided a fast, a fast way back to Europe. And then eight years later, he comes back uh, to Florida's southwestern coast in an attempt to settle a colony. He's, he's killed by, by uh, an arrow there. And in the meantime, he'd sent letters to the king, a new king, Charles V. And there's no mention, there's no mention of the fountain of youth. But what happens was a, another explorer, a guy named Hernando de Escalante Fontaneda. And yes, yes, friends, I have worked on that all week. All right, you're welcome. Um, who, he's a guy who kind of poked at Ponce about looking for the fountain of youth in his 1575 memoir. He kind of made a joke. And all of a sudden, this starts being talked about, right? And the fountain of youth legend was now alive and well. But it didn't gain much traction for us here in the U.S. until the Spanish ceded Florida in 1819. But, and by the early 20th century, a statue of the explorer, there he is, um, was, was placed at the central plaza of Florida's oldest city, some of you know, St. Augustine, and a nearby tur- tourist attraction pretended to be the actual fountain of youth. And to this day, tens of thousands of visitors come every year to sample the sulfur-smelling well water. One tourist said, it does not taste good. <laughs> Imagine what you would think the fountain of youth would taste like. It doesn't taste like that, they said. Meanwhile, some school textbooks continue to present Ponce de Leon's search for the fountain as historical fact. So, no fountain of youth. No fountain of youth. That's a bummer. That kind of goes against everything we believe, doesn't it? I mean, even as recently as the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, they were touting the fountain of youth. Man, so it's a bit disappointing. But it doesn't stop us, me and you, from making this our quest. Defying aging, right? Defying aging. But like Charles Barkley, the old basketball player, is often credited with saying, Father Time is undefeated. Father Time's undefeated. Father Time's going to win every time. There's no fountain of use, so that means we're all, barring Jesus coming back in the next little bit, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. That's a newsflash, but we're all going to die. So we want to do what's best with the time we're allotted, don't we? We want to do what's best. We want to do our best with this time, let's say it this way, we want to live well, don't we? We want to live well. I haven't found the survey out there whose results contradicted this, that 100 out of 100 people surveyed wanted to live well, wanted to live a full life, wanted to get the most out of what life has to offer. I mean, who doesn't want that? Everybody wants that. Now, some of us may get lost along the way, Some of us might get tangled up in stuff that we don't need to get tangled up in. Some of us might have gotten hurt or beaten down or sidetracked and lost sight, and we've we've settled for something far less at this point. That's understandable. It happens way too often. But we all, somewhere deep down, want to live well, don't we? So let's talk about a very, very practical way in which we can do that today. Now, I've been in ministry eh, 25-ish years years. Like, man, Josh, you look so young. Found a youth, baby. In the business of trying to help people live well. And I am always interested in ways in which that could happen. So a few months ago, a few months ago, 
I listened to a podcast, and the podcast was entitled Happiness in America, The Secret to a Good Life. I was intrigued. Huh, I wonder what they're going to say. And this podcast, by the way, was not being put on by a, a church or a religious organization or even a faith-based company. No, not at all. It was produced, hilariously, by a pop culture and sports organization. Now, I like their work in those areas, so when I saw this podcast, I was like, huh, I wonder what they had to say about this. Let's see what's going on here. What they would say is the secret to living a good life. And as I started listening, I was floored in a very good way. The host was interviewing a couple of guests who have written a book chronicling a study done by Harvard University that has been going on for 80 plus years. 80 plus years this one study has been going on. So this research has followed hundreds of young men from their late teenage years into adulthood. They've observed these guys as they've grown up, as they've uh, gotten married, as they've entered the workforce, as they've retired, all this stuff. A young man named John Kennedy, middle initial F, was even part of, of when this, this study got started. And the studies come to some conclusions about what it looks like to live, in their words, a long and fulfilling life. And at the risk of bearing the lead, here's what they found. The key from this study to a life well lived is found in this phrase, social fitness. Social fitness. Let me first tell you what this doesn't mean, okay? This has nothing to do with social technologies that we have at our disposal these days. In fact, they cite how today Americans surveyed will discuss how they are as lonely or lonelier than any generation that's come before. Just think about that for a minute. We live in this age of social media where you can be connected to people all over the country. You can be connected to people all over the world. Pen pals just at your fingertips. Yet based on studies, one in five millennials, those born, born around the turn of the millennium there, um, they say they have no friends, around one in five millennials. For around a decade or so, the amount of time people spend alone has been on the rise. We have this incredible amount of access to technologies designed to help us connect, yet it's fake. It's not real. It's pseudo-connectivity. It's what the podcast host called the illusion of togetherness. This, it's this illusion of togetherness. And then he said, we have dazzled ourselves into solitude. We've dazzled, we've entertained ourselves into solitude. And this largest and longest study in American history is teaching us a whole lot about living well. And the phrase that kept coming up was this phrase, this social fitness phrase. Because according to the authors, this social fitness is the key to both mental and physical health for you and for me. And social fitness, much like physical fitness, it's a reflection of our health. And the Harvard study reveals this, that those who were living the well-lived life were those who were doing the best at being connected to others. Think about that. Think about that. The people who were living life well were the people who were relating well to others. Does this surprise you? It should not surprise you. Living well walks arm in arm with relating to others, with having friends. And the Harvard study has found that's good for our health. And we get this. We understand this because relationships, we know, they help with stress, don't they? They're good stress busters. I was talking to a friend this week, and, and they apologize after. They're like, hey, man, I was just venting, a lot of venting there. I was like, it's okay. We get that. We understand. You got to vent to somebody. It helps deal with stress. In relationships, we experience meaning and purpose and vitality. And when we're sharing our burdens, walking alongside others, it helps us be who we're made to be. Um, science is beginning to understand all of this, but it's coming around to what's been known for a long, long time. And it's fascinating to me, fascinating, that this study is connecting health to relational wellness. Because we know there are certain activities that feed our souls, don't we? We know this. Think about, think about the hottest sport in the country right now. Some of you play it, and you play it well. Pickleball, right? Any pickleballers out there? One hand. That's great. Two, three, four. Okay, some of you. If you haven't played, if you're not playing pickleball, you're the only people in America not playing it. And me too. I'll talk about me in a minute. I, I haven't played yet. I haven't started yet. I will. I promise I will. I will get into it. I may be in the minority. But people all over 
are playing pickleball, old people, young people, all people. And while I'm sure the sport is great and fun and all, I can't help but imagine that what's drawing people to pickleball is connection. People play together, and then they do life together. People make friends at pickleball. People go out to eat with fellow pickleballers. Some pickleballers form pickleball posses. That's a real thing. Like a mafia of pickleball, looking out for all things pickleball. You laugh. I am not joking. That is a real thing. Look out for those pickleballers. Just make sure you mind your P's and Q's when you're out there because somebody will get you. I'm, I'm for real. Uh, for real, be careful. And But play pickleball. But we know why that's going on, because people connect. And exercise is this deal, has this rippling effect in our lives, doesn't it? As you're exercising, you're connecting to people. If you go out walking with neighbors, how that helps your health. Come play softball with us every other Wednesday. We played on a smaller field this week, and people were hitting home runs all over the place. It was awesome, right? Come play. Shows over and over again that exercise and connection is part of what's going on here. Research provides the evidence that closeness and quality of connection matter so much right now, but also later in life. The studies have especially seen this in the lives of women. And while the studies have shown the need for social fitness, there have been some parallels happening in other aspects. Studies are also showing that in the last 10 years, the time we spend alone has increased by eight hours a week, by a whole night's sleep. In the last 30 years, Americans reporting five or more friends has dropped 25%. 25%. Two decades ago, 38% of Americans would have told you they communicated with a friend at least uh, on an average day, about once a day. Like that, that happened, right? That number has dropped 10% in 2021. What will the next 10 years hold for us? What will the next 10 years hold for us if this trend continues? People are waking up to this. The Surgeon General, a guy named Vivek Murthy, has made emotional well-being part of his core platform. This is unprecedented, that people are seeing this and starting to act accordingly. The research reveals that some of the loneliest people, get this, among us these days are collegians. Some of the loneliest people among us are collegians. College kids on college campuses full of other college kids, many of whom have a whole lot in common, but they're lonely. So many of them are being kidnapped by their screens, and social media, and technology, and the illusion of togetherness is just that. It's an illusion. It doesn't matter how many friends you have on Facebook, or how many people you follow on Instagram, or whatever the heck people do with TikTok, and Snapchat, and all the others. It doesn't matter. It's not real. It's not connection. It's not socially fit. By the way, there is a difference between loneliness and solitude, right? Loneliness is this feeling of a lost connection that you desire, and it's subjective, but solitude is more about being alone and content and solitude for many of us is very soul forming. So social media and all technology's promises about living well in connection, they can't replace true connection. In many ways, they are are De Leon's uh, fountain of youth all over again. They're not real. They can't replace you and me and the importance of our relationship and how that so desperately matters to living well. Because there's all this research that we do between ages 0 and 18 about all the changes and all the development that happens in, a, in someone's life. But then that research from 18 to 80, guess what? There's still changes happening to you and me because aging comes with all sorts of challenges, doesn't it? All sorts of struggles, all sorts of adjustments. But the Harvard study found that in many, many cases, people were growing happier as they aged. Through all those changes, through all those struggles, through all those adjustments, through bodies failing them, through retirement, through the loss of loved ones and friends, so how they do it? Social fitness. Social fitness. They grew in wisdom about the things that mattered most, and one of those being the importance of connection. Many of the surveyed folks were people who have, who have experienced war, who've gone to war, and they look back on that experience as one that grew them, changed them, shaped them. Many saw those super difficult experiences as actually good things, and they connected it to connection. They were close to the folks in their units and their squads. Listen, listen, listen. When, when you hear an, an ex-athlete talk about their, their playing career and what they miss about it, quite often you will hear them reference how much they miss their friends, the people they played with, the people that they, uh, that they battled with left and right in those games and those competitions. They miss their friends. And it's been stated so many times that it's kind of cliche 
by now, but when folks are surveyed as they near death, their biggest regret has nothing to do with achievement or work. Nothing to do with achievement or work. But the answers often sound the same. I wish I had spent time with the people I care about. I wish I'd spent more time with those people. Do you know who research reveals struggles the most with social fitness? It's not kids. They get it. They understand. Watch them as they they play together. They know the value of connection. It's not senior adults. They get it. They've seen it their whole lives. You know the research is someone struggles with this the most? Middle-aged folks. Over and over in the research, it's your 40-somethings who struggle with social fitness the most. Many, in fact, revealing that they were downright miserable. Of course, there's many reasons for this. There's stress, there's burdens, there's caring for kids, caring for aging parents. All that happening in their lives. All that's happening in their lives. But the most likely excuse is busyness, to not invest in connection, to not be socially fit. Trust me, I lead out in our group's effort here at Village. I know. I know this demographic and how we struggle with it. Also, trust me, I'm a 40-something. Please don't tell anybody. It'll be our little secret, okay? Don't tell anybody. I know busyness. I know that sometimes after taking care of so many responsibilities, I don't really want to connect with others. No offense. I don't. I don't want to. I'm tired. I'm worn out. I may even be a little bit cranky. Sitting alone in a room with a good book or a good TV show sounds pretty good to me from time to time. Sounds pretty good. But that's not how I grow. That's not how I practice social fitness. That's not how I live well. And please know, I'm not railing on us taking time to regroup. I know, especially for the introverts in this room, sometime, some, some time alone, that that solitude, that feeds us so we can pursue then being fit socially. So, While incredible, long-lasting Harvard studies may be cool, we know this isn't something new. We know that. We know that this is important. Science may be catching up, and I'm glad it is, but my goodness, God's surely known this. We may just be discovering it now, but it's been part of his plan since the foundations of time. And I got to tell you, I love when science catches up with what God's up to. It's fantastic. And it lights me up when I hear people with no faith base at all talking about Jesus' spiritual practices as if they're newfangled ideas. I love it, not because it's just another avenue where I see God at work. And in many cases, folks don't even realize it. And maybe you're here today. You're here today and you're like, "Uh, are we going to talk about God or about the Bible or about Jesus? And I'm going to tell you this. We have been the whole time, the whole time. Because whether you call it social fitness or whether you call it fellowship, it's the same God who is wanting this for you and me. The one whom, out of his very Trinitarian being, created us as relational people. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit relationship of the three-in-one God calls us to relate to him and to each other. He calls us to live well. In fact, Jesus said this in John 10.10. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This has always been one of my favorite verses. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now, Jesus was contrasting with this verse, what the the thief, what the enemy comes to do. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that they may have life, have it to the full. The New Living Translation translates this verse like this. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Again, yes, sign me up. That's great, Jesus. I'm in. The New American Standard translates this verse as, I have come so that they would have life and have it abundantly. That's a big old word, and I like it. They'd have it abundantly. Man, you talk about some abundant life I'm in. New King James translates this verse the same way. Eugene Peterson's message paraphrase writes this verse like this, I came so that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Holy cow. Jesus isn't advertising some bait and switch thing here. He's saying this life is for you and he wants you and me to live well. I don't think he came to live, die, and live again so we can just phone it in and look forward to what's to come. Heaven on our mind, earth we leave behind. Sounds like a bad country song, doesn't it? I don't think that's his aim for you and me, though. I think he longs, I believe he longs for you and me to be socially fit children of his. Not for his sake, not for our sake, but for the sake of all of us. Because we are men, women, and students who've been created to connect with other men, women, and students formed 
for relationship, made to be together. We practiced a faith rooted in the one another command. Some 100 times, Google tells me in the New Testament, there's a command to practice one anothering, the social fitness aspect of our faith. There's 59 specific ones, and they look like this. Love one another. You find that over and over and over again in the New Testament. Love one another, love one another, love one another, over and over and over again. Then we find this one. Be devoted to one another. Be devoted to one another in Romans 12. Romans 12 is chock full of them, by the way. Paul was on one there. Being devoted to one another, right? Be that. Honor one another above yourselves. Live in harmony with one another. I love that verse. Live in harmony. That's a good word, harmony, right? You experience that in your relationships? Harmony? Live in harmony with one another. Stop passing judgment on one another. Now Paul's just reading her mail, isn't he? Like, Paul, have you, have you been walking around with me day in and day out? You've seen how I talk about people? Stop passing judgment on one another. He's not done in Romans. Accept one another as Christ accepted you. How did Christ accept me? As ugly as I can be is how he accepted me. He says, accept one another in that way. He moves on to Galatians. He says, serve one another. Serve one another another. Then on to Ephesians, bear, bear with one another. It's funny, that, that word bear, you really kind of get the feeling of it, right? Bear with, hang in there with each other, right? Bear with one another. Submit to one another. You know what? I don't wake up on Monday morning thinking, I wonder who I can help have a better day than me today. I don't always think that. I probably should. Submit to one another. Forgive one another. Forgive one another. He goes on. In Colossians, admonish one another. Then in 1 Thessalonians, encourage each other. Not on one another, but you get it, same thing there. Encourage each other. Then pray for each other. That's James, the brother of Jesus, saying pray for each other. On and on and on and on. You read the New Testament, you're seeing one another, one another, one another, one another, one another. For the Christian today, that we, he's sitting in this room, we follow one one another Savior. We walk in his footsteps. He sets the pace, we Follow. The Jesus life isn't a lone wolf deal. It's not a one-man show. There's this old saying by this Christian, de these Christian desert fathers. There's this group of Christians who went and just lived out in the desert, like just following Jesus there. And the saying goes like this, one Christian is no Christian. Isn't that fascinating? One Christian is no Christian because it's a one another faith. And the main mechanism, mechanism which we strive to follow this one anothering here at Village is through groups. And now you're like, oh, yeah, the groups talk. Yeah, that's the groups talk. What took you so long to catch on? Um, we want to spur each other on to social fitness here, to live well. I want you to live well. I hope you want me to live well so that we can live well living out what God's called us to. And we want to do this through group life. We also want to do this, by the way, through serving on teams together. So if you're not serving on a team yet, like I'd love to jump in. Hey, information desk has sign-up sheets. Man, jump in. We'd love for you to jump on a team today so you, to help each other live well. But we like to get in groups during the school year in order for us to care for each other here as part of God's kingdom that we call Village Church. And we hope three things happen in these groups, okay, during the year. We refer to them as the ABCs. We didn't make them up. We stole them from a church who was further along than us. That in a group, you experience accountability, belonging, and care, okay? And let's break them down real quick before we get out of here today. First, accountability, okay? Okay. There was another Harvard study. Harvard does a lot of studies, by the way. They found that 99% of your success depends on one thing, who you associate with, who you associate with, who you are accountable to. You may not realize it, but, but you can, can be like a chameleon. I can too. You can and will absorb the attitudes, opinions, and behaviors of those you choose to spend the most time with, which is insightful. Like whenever you get to talking to somebody about politics, which is I get is a dangerous thing, um, but you know real quick, don't you, who they've been watching. You know real quick, you're like, oh, I know where I know where this is coming from. Okay. You know real quick what news slant they've been spending their most time with. You know it because they've absorbed it. It's become part of them. If you spend time with positive thinkers, you start to become like them. You spend time with Debbie Downers, with negative thinkers, you will become like them. Choose your friends wisely. A guy named D Dr. David Cullen conducted a 25-year-old 25 25-year-old uh, Harvard study and found that your reference group your homies, people you hang with, right, has the power to impact you and your future in a profound way. 
He said that 99% of your success depends on who you call my friends, on who you are accountable to. So, those of us in the room today, why not be accountable? Why not be known to a group of Christ followers walking in the same direction as you? Seems like that would help us live well, doesn't it? Get in a group. Second, second, belonging, the B, belonging. Are you old enough to remember the TV show Cheers? Remember that, that show, Cheers? Disregard the fact that it was about a bar for a minute, okay? Do you remember the theme song? Sometimes you got to go where? Where everybody knows your name, man. Where everybody knows your name. We all need a place where we could walk in and someone yell, Norm, right? We all need one of those, even if your name's not Norm. No, you know, whatever your name happens to be. Fill in the blank. Some place where people know your name, where people yell at you in affection. We all need a place where people know our names. We need a people to whom we belong. And for many of you, that's your family. That's great. For some of you, it's your friends. That's great. But we all need belonging, a place where we're known, a place where we're loved, a one another to be a part of. We need to belong, get in a group. Third one, care. Maybe you've had an experience that's been difficult, and maybe you felt like, man, nobody, nobody really checked in, right? Maybe, maybe you suffered and needed a friend, and you, and you wondered, where's the church at? And maybe you've gone through some life change and, and no one really noticed. And, and maybe you walk around with, with some hurt there, even resentment toward the church, be it this one or any other one, because of that. And, you know, I'll tell you, we, we've had this happen to us a few times, a few, few times where folks, folks are actually no longer here because they, they felt they were let down by us. And, and those are tough. Those are tough. They're always tough. But the first place my mind goes when I hear of that happening, which is terrible and I, and I hate it when it does happen, is this, I, I wonder if they were in a group. Were they in a group? Were they sharing their life with other people? Were they connected in a group? Were they known by 10 to 12 people? If not, how in the world could anybody have known what they were going through? How could that even happen if they weren't known? They weren't being cared for within a small group. And, and listen, our, our, our dream for this village is that we're going to continue to grow. Because people are going to continue to come to be a part of what's going on here. And if we're not plugging into groups, it's going to make that even harder to get cared for if we're not plugging in. We want care, yet we don't open ourselves up to receive care. We want to be connected, but we won't take the risk to be connected. Get in a group. So my challenge for you today and for the next few weeks is that we're going to have these cards out on, on your seats. And it's a group's card. It's group season time. And my encouragement to you would be to sign up for a group. Not because we report numbers back to somebody, hey, we had X number of people in groups. We don't do that. We want you to be in a group because it's one of the best things for you in being socially fit. What science is telling us, what helps us live better lives. So fill out the card, drop it in a basket on your way out today. And we're going to do our best to pair you up with a group that best meets your needs. Now, will we get this right 100% of the time? No, we're going to try. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. This is a trial and error little bit thing. We want to take a risk to be socially fit because apparently a well-lived life is a life lived well with the help of others. And groups are one of the key ways we connect here at Village. Part of our very essence, part of our, our DNA as we say it, that we're better together. Anything you can do, we can do better. We is greater than I. And when I look back at my life and I see my most significant seasons of growth happened because of the people I was around or maybe the adversity I was facing with those people. And I imagine you can do the same. So take a chance. Connect in a group. In fact, I don't know where else you'll, you'll hear this, but it doesn't have to be here. It doesn't have to be here. It doesn't have to be part of village. Get some friends together and intentionally start looking out for each other at work in your neighborhood. Go play pickleball. Do it there. Whatever that looks like. One counselor I read this week, he said this, every day in a thousand ways, our bodies are screaming at us, sounding the alarms that we're disconnected and we're lonely. Listen to your body. You can't make friends sitting at home alone. Get out of the house, join a team, join a club, volunteer, invite someone out for lunch, invite people over, go for a walk without your headphones in and say hello to others. You are worth extraordinary friendships with great people, but real connection requires real 
effort. Friends, life's too short to not live it abundantly. There is no fountain of youth. So let's live it well, together, the way God's created us to. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for setting the pace that as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the relation you have, the relationship you have, that you now see that for us and call us to that, God, to relate well to one another so that we can live abundant lives. Lives that you call us to live. God, at the end of the day, that's what I want. I think that's what we all want. So, Father, help us. One, give us the courage to sign up, be in a group, take part in, a group, in group life this year. And, God, that as we do, that we would find that we are living life well because we are living in the way that you have called us to live. And we're going to trust you as we do this, as we do in all things. And we're going to trust you in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Josh. Hey, and that's one of our dreams and goals. You guys know that here is uh, we, we do believe that life is better when we're connected and we've got a group of people around us. And so I would reiterate what Josh said too. You don't have to do a village group here. I mean, we love it whenever we can connect village people with village people. But our dream for you, our goal for you is that you are in a group with some people running in the same direction because we say it all the time um, uh, that you show me your friends, I'll show you your future, that we end up wherever the people that we're hanging out with are going in most cases. So surround yourself with good people and be a good people that other people like to be surrounded by, right? That, we're, that um, when we do this, that we're just looking to, to uh, find people to run this race with because, because inevitably there's going to come a time where we need more than we've got. And so sometimes we say that on, on days when my faith is strong and, and I've got people around me who are in a difficult place, I get to share my faith, right? I get to, I get to reach over and say, hey, I can, I can pull this wagon a little bit. I can bear this burden a little bit right now. And other days, uh, and, and man, I, I make no apologies. I've got uh, a tight-knit group of, uh, of an inner circle of people that, um, that I've had with me since college, and they don't even live around here, but they'll get random texts. It'll be, man, I just need prayer today. And it's just, you just need those people in your life that you can call in at a second. And even if it's from a distance and what they're doing is just interceding through prayer, that you've got those people in your life. We're made for it. We're built for it. So we encourage you. That's our, that's our dream. And like we've said before too, um, uh, who knows? I can't ever imagine a scenario where we wouldn't be able to gather in large groups in churches together. But if that ever happened, right? I mean, I hope Village Church is here forever, okay? But if next week Village Church is gone, the church is not affected because we have already begun gathering in smaller groups. We've got people, the church goes on, and that's how it was planned. I hope we get to do all the things we do forever. But more than that, I hope that forever. When our college students leave here, that's what we tell them. We don't tell them to look for a church first. We tell them to look for a group of people they can do life with. Find people on your hall. Look on your campus for a Christian organization. Find those other people running that race and start a small group. Find a church and find one. In, that's great, but find a group of people to do life with because it is that important. So we believe in that. So um, uh, we want to encourage you in that. And if we can help in that, we want to be part of that with you as well. Um, a couple of things where you get out of here. Uh, Hub students, 415 right here today. We are going to lake it up. Um, you're going to be glad you did. So uh, come on, uh, hang out. This is kind of our our big throw off. Um, uh, hey, will somebody text Tim Brown and tell him our service isn't done yet? And uh, it's my brother. Um, anyway, so uh, Hub Students 415 right here. We'll, we'll meet up with you guys here. And next Sunday afternoon, next Sunday afternoon, be watching for that in the V-mail. And then Sunday morning, next Sunday, we'll tell you more about it. But we're going to get to uh, celebrate baptism with several of our village kids. I mean, we're just going to keep doing it, man. We've had several of our kids who have put their faith in Christ, and we just love making a big deal about it because it is the biggest deal. So we throw a party, and um, Mark, I'm sorry we didn't get cake today, but Sunday for the kids will have cake. So, uh, yeah, so be here. I mean, I'll get Mark some cake. Uh, if you get to see Mark, say hi, high five, and just tell him, uh, man, excited for him in the journey that he's on. But we're excited for you. If you've got questions about that or other things, grab us after this. Uh, we'd love to talk with you, pray with you. And um, in the meantime, man, pray for each other around you. You never know what somebody in this very room carried in here today. So just be, let's just be people who are praying and lifting each other up. Pray for our college students that are, uh, many of them already back. We're missing several of our college students because they've already launched into to classes schedule. And, and then for our local students and teachers, teachers, we got you. Hey, 
Hazel's actually getting ready to go back to school. I know uh, Georgia's like, man, we've been in school for like three months. And uh, we're going to, I think we're going to do it. I think we're going back. And uh, so uh, North Carolina teachers, Clay County teachers, uh, especially uh, Cherokee County, I think y'all going back this week too, Matt. Y'all back in it, Shana. Yeah. So pray for our teachers, pray for our students, and let's look forward to a big year, God doing what he wants in our lives. Okay. All right. Thanks for being here. We'll catch you next Sunday.